Well, so Thelton, what, what would you pick out as the most significant cases you've heard? Um, we know there have been many important ones, or decided, uh, that, that, but what would you say? Uh, there are a lot of them over the years, uh, and I think probably the one that won't go away <laughs> and, <laughs> and is emerging as the case that may define me if I'm def uh, ever going to be defined is uh, my jail case, the uh, prison case, the California prison case, Plata uh, versus Schwarzenegger was the original name of it. Uh, it's uh, a case that uh, is very important to me, and it's ongoing. Uh, when I got that case, um, the uh, uh, expert that I hired to advise me on medical things uh, did a report that showed that on average in the 33 California prisons, a prisoner was dying from medical neglect or malfeasance or malpractice every six days in our prison system. And it was totally unacceptable. It was, uh, many of our uh, prisons were, uh, had essentially third world kinds of facilities. They were just, uh, they had 18 doctors in the system who had lost their license to practice in the outside world. It was just, and I got into that because it, it was a matter of life and death, literally. And uh, it was such a thing that I did something that uh, had never been done before. I appointed a receiver to take over the medical part of the prison system. And uh, we've been working over the years now, and we're actually getting to a point where uh, 26, I think, Michael's here. How many? How many of the prisons are probably okay now? We're still evaluating. We're still okay. <laughs> okay, Michael's my statistics man. He remembers the things that I used to remember. Uh, but anyway, we're getting there, and we're probably talking about rounding that final curb and the prisons are in good shape. Uh, so that's certainly a, a very important case. Uh, I'm reminded Barbara sent me many of my best and favorite clerks over these years. And my first clerk, Barbara sent me, Josh Bolton. Uh, and that's before I had a reputation. So, uh, uh, you know, at, at now people look to me if they want a judge who's public interest and liberal maybe, uh, but uh, back then I didn't have a reputation. And Josh uh, was a wonderful law clerk, very, very smart uh, law clerk who ended up being George W's chief of staff. And we haven't talked for a while yet, but uh, <laughs> not because there's any enmity, but we don't have much to talk about. <laughs> but anyway, I. This isn't about a case, but it's a story that I like to tell. Um, and you should listen, Haywood, because you, you know the powers of a federal judge because you clerk, but I didn't. And Josh came to me one day with a petition uh, saying, here's a motion uh, for a, a temporary restraining order. Uh, the Navy uh, on uh, uh, turn uh, the naval yard here in, uh, in Alameda. Uh, uh, they were polluting the bay uh, with things, and there was a restraining order. And my first question to Josh was, can I restrain the Navy? <laughs> I mean, I had no idea federal judges could do that kind of thing. But anyway, a another uh, case uh, that ended up uh, not so well was my Prop 209 case, which is certainly a significant case to me. This is the affirmative action case. I found that California's Prop 209 was unconstitutional for what I felt were 
solid legal grounds. There was precedent, I thought, uh, and I still think that, uh, that uh, I was really citing precedent of a Washington case uh, which said that things that were very similar to Prop 209 uh, uh, created an impermissible barrier to due process for minority groups. And in using that case, I uh, found that 209 was unconstitutional. My thought at the time was that uh, it would probably be uh, affirmed by the Ninth Circuit. They would certainly appeal it. Uh, and it might get uh, changed at the Ninth Circuit. I was so sure of my analysis that I reasoned that they wouldn't reverse me as much as just state a new rule, that this rule, which was uh, quite an old case, uh, they would just say this is no longer good law. But uh, instead I got reversed. Uh, a panel uh, got it at the Ninth Circuit and they reversed it and that was the end of Prop 209. But it was a very important case uh, and uh, I remember it well. Another uh, was the Agent Orange case. I get cases, it seems, more than most judges that stay around for years. Uh, and I don't know quite why that is, but I got... As you work on it. <laughs> no, I, I do. I try to make the changes that I think are necessary. Uh, and uh, one of the first cases of uh, 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 veterans uh, suing uh, over medical treatment, veterans who had served uh, and gotten exposed to Agent Orange. And again, the case went for many years, and I was shocked. Again, I, I came on the bench fairly naive. I thought certainly the Veterans Administration is there to serve veterans and take care of veterans. And I was shocked that they didn't do that. Uh, and I had other shocks later on. Uh, the Bureau of Indian Affairs was there to take care of Indians, uh, <laughs> which they don't seem to do very well. But anyway, uh, that case was very important because the VA was neglecting care for veterans. When the case first started, they'd only identified one illness or one ail ailment that was attributed to or a Agent Orange. Uh, but over the years, as the case kept going, they've identified more and more things that, there were, was, that were a result of Agent Orange. And so the VA was getting farther and farther behind in treating it. They weren't treating adequately the one ailment they started off identifying. And uh, I pushed that case for about 10 years and uh, finally, uh, uh, I had uh, issued an order uh, that uh, they had to make a change uh, and they were to come back to me in 60 days to tell me how the uh, changes went, if they had made these changes. And I, I, I learned something from this experience. Uh, it was, uh, we came back in mid-January, and they hadn't made the changes that I had ordered, and uh, they had filed a, an affidavit saying, explaining that, well, you know, this is a federal agency, and things slow down over the holidays. <laughs> and I was utterly astounded, and I, uh, Haywood, I should say, Haywood can tell you, and my other clerks who are here, I have a reputation uh, among my clerks. And Pearl, you know it too. You're laughing. You know what I'm going to say. My reputation with my law clerks, and I forget which one of you came up with this, was that the judge doesn't have any middle gears. <laughs> Either I'm cruising along in fifth gear and everything's calm, or I'm in fifth gear and I'm ready to run over somebody and kill them. And uh, so I went into fifth gear at this hearing and uh, ordered them to bring about a half dozen of the top officials to the VA and find them and have a contempt hearing. And that, really, that little simple act changed things around. And I, I, uh, I, I left it to the plaintiff's attorney, who was a very, very able guy who does wonderful work in, in veterans' affairs. And it, the reason he got into it was that his father 
uh, was a veteran who had been neglected, and so he was. And I left it to him. I said, uh, uh, you, you, "You'll come out here." I set the date for them to come out for the contempt hearing. I said, "Unless you satisfy Mr. S. Famer uh, that uh, everything is okay or progressing," and uh, he called me a few days later and I said, I think we have an agreement. I said, okay, but I'm not letting them off the hook. They're still going to come unless you say. And uh, he said, we've done it. They've done all the things. They've made up the time. And that was the last I heard of those attorneys. We've ended up closing the case about a year later satisfactorily. That was a very important case. Uh, there are many. I'm going to name a couple of more. Uh, the uh, my most popular case is the Dolphin case. Uh, I had the case of uh, 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 where uh, the fishing boats were catching tuna in uh, uh, Persane nets, which is a net that just scoops up everything in the tuna, and they catch dolphin because many of you may know that dolphins swim over tuna. And the way you find the tuna is that, hey, there are some dolphin. And you go and you scoop them all up in the net. And they were killing thousands of dolphin. And so there was legislation passed forbidding that. And uh, I won't go into the details as I have on these other two cases. But uh, I uh, forbade the ships uh, to go out and uh, uh, catch dolphin in that manner, uh, and it led to uh, the uh, 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 legislation that created dolphin safe tuna, which uh, I hope you all still buy. Uh, and, uh, but it was a very important case, and uh, for many years uh, uh, I would get letters and packages from school children, elementary school, middle school, uh, with little projects and pictures of dolphins saying, our teacher told us to write you uh, and thank you for saving the dolphins. So that's, that's by all means my most popular case. Uh, and I'll just mention one other because there's a kind of irony to it. I had a very important uh, uh, disability rights case at a time when I was not disabled. I was playing tennis and pretty active. Uh, it was Arnold versus United States. It uh, had to do with the movie theater. Uh, I'm United States versus United Artists. Uh, and uh, it, it involved accommodation for minority, uh, for for disability, disabled people going to the theater. There was no place for them to sit, and uh, you know they couldn't enjoy the movie the way everyone else could. And I ended up uh, ordering that. It was one of the early cases, and it was, wasn't clear uh, just where that uh, bill led. But I ordered them to uh, uh, accommodate and make space for uh, disability people. And I mention this uh, because uh, that theater is, uh, for those of you who know Berkeley, it's on Shattuck Avenue, not far from my house. And now when I go to that movie, I benefit from my ruling because <laughs> I've got a space there uh, to enjoy the movie. So that's one of my favorite cases. Too. <laughs>